Good morning, Crossing Church, and welcome to everyone who is joining us for this morning's meeting. Uh, Thank you so much for welcoming me into your home. Uh, My name is Chris, and along with my wife Tracy and my two boys, Reed and Jaden, we serve at the Crossing Church on the Deacon Team. And I want to thank Brad and the eldership for giving me the opportunity of sharing the Word of God with you this morning and what the Lord has placed on my heart for us during this season. The book of Psalms has really been a source of encouragement for me during this time. And David, who wrote many of the Psalms, obviously went through some some trials, some struggles um, uh, as king. And so many times he was pursued by people uh, who wanted to kill him for really many, many things and for what God had called him to in the time in which he had been called to it. And so we read Psalms like Psalm 3, where David says, Contend, O Lord, with those who contend with me. Fight against those who fight against me. And we might be feeling like at this time we're fighting so many battles um, due to the circumstances that we find ourselves in. I think of battles like our employment. Some of us may not be employed any longer or we're having to uh, work from home. Um, I think of business leaders who are having to diversify their businesses or are having to deal with the reality of retrenchments and other things. And I think of people who are just struggling financially for, well, for all of these reasons. And I want to ask you and encourage you to take these next 25 minutes. Let's listen to what the Lord is saying and let's settle some things in our hearts. David was in a similar place. And I just love how the Psalms kind of work things out. If you look, we are going to be uh, studying Psalm 145. And as you turn there, if we look at the five Psalms before that, um, they were all Psalms of prayer and supplication for the Lord and the situations that David was going through. But he understood that God was a God who would deliver him, and he had the ability to deliver him out of those situations. And so what he does is he ends the whole book of Psalms, and he he follows those five Psalms of prayer and supplication with six Psalms of praise and adoration of his deliverer. And I just love um, how, how that's all worked out. One of the greatest things that David is remembered for was the fact that he was a worshipper and that he was a man after God's own heart. And so right now, Lord, I pray that as we read through Psalm 145 and we speak about who you are and what you have done, that our eyes will be opened to your goodness, to your grace, to your mercy, and that we will be a people after your own heart. Right now, Lord, we surrender this time to you and we ask that you have your way in our hearts. For me, Lord, I pray that you will take over my mind and my words. Lord God, that um, Holy Spirit, you will speak um, to me and you will speak through me. I pray this in your mighty name, Lord Jesus. Amen. So the Psalms start and finish with two bookends. And uh, that is... David praising the name of the Lord. Isn't that wonderful? And um, this is a major theme that we see throughout the book of Psalms. And uh, David even ends the book of Psalms in this way. If we look at the last verse in Psalm 50, he says, Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. And so the title of this message is, Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. Verse 1 and 3, David praises God from his perspective, uh, out of his own. But then from verse 4 to 12, we see him move away from himself, and the praise is directed from others. It then moves on to God's kingdom, and speaking about his works, the works of God, from verse 13 to 20. And then he ends off, like I said, with that last bookend of praising the name of the Lord. Let's get into it. Psalm 145, a psalm of praise of David. I will exalt you, 
my God and my King. I will praise your name forever and ever. I will praise, uh, every day I will praise you and extol your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. His greatness no one can fathom. And what a wonderful way for David to open up this song. And here we see David exalt God. Now, the word exalt is to speak highly of someone. And David ex is exalting God, who David refers to as his God and as his king. He speaks highly. He, he praises God forever and ever because he knows that God is above all of the situations that are surrounding him. Every situation in which he has come to God and has asked God to rescue him out of, to protect him from, to deliver him from, these situations are really meaningless to the bigness and the greatness of God who is above every other thing. And so this is personal for David. David is knowledgeable about the God which he serves. And, and we, we, we see this in his dealings. We see this in his prayer, in his communion with God. Um, and it is visible to us by just how he addresses his God and his king. Something that struck me in this portion was that he refers to God as his king. And that's interesting because, because David was a king. And so he understands the authority, the, the rulership, the leadership, and the power um, that the title of king carries. And so he understands that he is not the main man. He is not the be-all and the end-all. But rather he understands his place in the, in the greater scheme of things. See, there's such a humility on David shown by how he addresses God. This is a, a, a humility that I see in Jesus Christ, and it's definitely something um, that we should strive for in how we respond to God. Um, friends, I want to ask, uh, what kind of relationship do you have with God? Do you have a relationship with Him? Do you have a relationship with Jesus? Is he king over your life? Does he carry a place of authority in your life where as you commune together, he can address things and speak into your life? Can he lead you through situations where you won't take offense, but will rather submit in humility to him and allow him to be your God and your king? If not, I want to introduce you to this wonderful God who carries this in my life. And I'm so grateful for it because without it, I know I would not be where I am today. David then goes on to say that he praises God daily, extolling his name. The New King James says that every day I will bless you. And that word bless comes from the root word barach, which means to kneel down. There's the humility again. David is in awe of his God and his king, and he kneels down before him in reverence of who God is. Now David is about to share with us some amazing revelation of who, just who God is and we realize that intertwined in all of these verses are two themes, namely the character of God and the works of God. Now, we know who God is by what God does. Isn't that wonderful? We know who God is by what God does. And so as we read on, let us consider his works. Let us consider his ways and then allow him to change some things in our hearts. That's the point of the scripture. That is the point of the word that he has given us. So who is God? Who is this God and King that David 
places so much emphasis on. I want to encourage you to read the, the verses that follow from verse 3 to verse 12. Study them and allow the Holy Spirit to reveal himself through those scriptures. As I meditated on them, I felt the following stood out. But for time's sake, I'm going to highlight to you what stood out to me rather than read them out, if that's okay. <laughs> uh, he is good, so good that one generation will commend him to another. He is mighty in act and deed. His splendor is too grand for us to gaze upon him. He is majestic and glorious in his magnificence. He is wonderful in all his ways. He is powerful in his awesome works and great in deed. He is abundant in goodness and righteous in all his dealings. He is gracious and compassionate. He is patient and kind. He is rich in love and abounding in blessing. His glory and might overflows throughout his kingdom. And his kingdom portrays his glorious splendor. This is a God who I want to serve, whose throne I want to bow down to, and as verse 7 says, whose righteousness I want to joyfully, joyfully sing of. But at the same time, as awesome and as jaw-dropping as this God sounds because of what I've just read, I can promise you that it doesn't come close to describing the heart and the depth, the length and the breadth of who this God really is. He is great and he deserves our praise and our adoration when we see his mighty acts. If we look at Matthew chapter 14 from verse 27 to 33, Jesus has just been praying on a mountain. And uh, his disciples are on a boat and they are sailing across the lake. And Jesus wants to join them. And so he is walking on the water towards the boat. And when the disciples look and they see him, they think at first that he is a ghost. And so he says, um, uh, Jesus immediately said to them, Take courage, it is I. Don't be afraid. Lord, if it is you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. Come. He said, then Peter got down out of the boat. He walked on the water and came towards Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid and beginning to sink. He cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand, caught him. And he said, oh, you of little faith. Why did you doubt? And when they climbed in the boat, the wind died down. Then those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. Isn't that wonderful? Jesus here, we see him practicing what is called divine rites. You see, because the first commandment says that you shall have no other gods but me. And Jesus, knowing the scripture all too well, would never have, have received worship um, because he knew that Worship was, was limited only to one God, but he is that God. He is part of the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And so it is uh, proper for him to receive that praise and that worship for the works in which they, as the disciples, had just witnessed. Today, we may be facing a storm. I want to encourage us as believers Let's keep our eyes fixed on Jesus Christ. You see, because the minute that our eyes move off of Jesus and start to focus on the wind and the waves, the wind and the waves become more powerful than him in our minds. The minute we take our eyes off Jesus, we place more power and more might in COVID-19 than we do in Jesus I want to encourage us, friends, let's keep our eyes fixed on Jesus Christ. Why? Because he is the King of kings. He is the Lord of lords. And he is 
much bigger and much greater and much more powerful than all the situations around us. COVID-19, all the wind, all the waves, all these things surrounding us, He is greater than them all. So let's keep our eyes fixed on Him and those things will not matter to us any longer. They won't, they, they won't uh, cast so much fear in our hearts because we know that we serve and our eyes are fixed on a king um, who is greater than what is surrounding us. The level of God's greatness needs to be matched by the same level of praise that we give him as his saints. Verse 3 says, Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised. And so this statement might seem a little bit far-fetched, but actually if you look at the wording that David uses, he uses great and great. It's the same two words. Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised. And so his greatness needs to be matched by the worship and the praise that is given to him. And so that might seem difficult, but listen to this. It also goes on to say that his greatness no one can fathom. The New King James uh, says that his greatness is unsearchable. Therefore, we will never get to the end of his greatness. So continue to pursue a knowledge of his greatness, and his praise will likewise be unending. You see, friends, we cannot worship God from, an, from our own understanding because we cannot fathom God. He is unsearchable. And so I want to encourage you to get to a place where you realize, actually, God, you are unfathomable. You are unsearchable. And as such, I can only but lay my life down, throw myself with my head on the floor and bow in reverence and in adoration of who you are because it is too big for me to understand. You see, great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. If we were to worship him from our own understanding, unfortunately, we wouldn't give him the credit, the glory, the honor, the worship and the praise that he deserves. And so get to a place of understanding that actually I cannot understand who he is, and then worship him from that place. And then he will get the glory and the worship and the praise that he so deserves. If we go down to verse 13, when we carry on from there, it says, Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and your dominion endures throughout all generations. The Lord is trustworthy in all he promises, and he is faithful in all that he does. David understood the trustworthiness of God very well. There are numerous occasions where God delivered David out of his darkest situations. And even in David's sin and adultery with Bathsheba, God was faithful to his word. He had called David to do certain things for the glory of his kingdom for the building of his kingdom. And he was faithful to that word. And so even in David's sin, he was able to restore David because restoring David resulted in him being faithful to his word. Jesus, likewise, is trustworthy, friends. I would encourage you to put your faith in him. I'm reminded of John 14, verse 46, where Jesus is in Galilee, and this is the place where he had performed his, his first miracle of turning the water into, into wine. And so he is back there. And a royal official whose son is very, very ill, he is on his deathbed, um, uh, hears of Jesus. And so this official realizes that um, well, he has exhausted pretty much every option that he had, and yet his son is still lying on his deathbed, uh, about to die. And so without any other option, without any other hope, he decides to put his hope and his trust in Jesus. That is his last hope, to trust in Jesus. And so he goes and he finds 
where Jesus is in Galilee. And he begs Jesus to come back with him to his house and to heal his son. And Jesus doesn't respond in the way that he's asking, but how he does respond is to send him away. So number one, he had to trust in Jesus Christ. He then goes and he asks Jesus to heal his son. And now he has to trust Jesus again because it's about one day's journey for him to return home. And so he has to trust that Jesus is saying what he is saying. And Jesus says, you may go, your son will live. And I love the words uh, after that. He had to trust in Jesus so much. And it says that he took Jesus at his word. (laughs) Isn't that beautiful? Can we take Jesus at his word? If he says, I am trustworthy, can we trust in Jesus to, to fulfill and to be faithful to his word? He then departed. And on his journey home, he's met by some of his servants who say to him that at the seventh hour, which is when Jesus had said to him that your son will be made well, his son recovered. And so Jesus is faithful to his word. He was restored to full health. Psalm 56 verse 3 says that when I am afraid, I will trust in you. I love that. Isn't that a key scripture for us in this season? As we consider who God is by the works he performs, we can understand and trust that he is in fact, trustworthy. His works are commendable, friends. Look, look back on your lives and you will see that his hand has been over your life. I believe that there have been times where you've looked back and said, or times where you've looked and said, my Lord, you are not with me. Where are you? Why have you forsaken me? And uh, you may have felt that he was far in those times, but I, I can promise you that in those times he was near to you. I look back at some of the situations in my life where I cried out to God and I couldn't understand why he was bringing me through these, these, um, these times of difficulty. And I look at it now and I'm aware of his hand over my life. After all, it does say that he is the potter and we are the clay. And sometimes it's not easy for him to mold us and to, to shape us that, um, that clay has got to go through some stuff in order for God to, to make it into the perfect thing that he is wanting to create. And so sometimes it might not be, be nice, the things that we go through. But I want to encourage you, friends. He has got a plan and a purpose for you. And uh, even in this time as we are in lockdown and um, we are apart but together, I want to encourage you. He's got you in the palm of his hands. As he he uses um, that spinning wheel right now and he's busy uh, molding you, his hands are all over you. And so be encouraged that God has got you in his hands and he's doing something great. You might not see it right now, but uh, a couple of years from now, you may be super, super thankful for what he has done. So take courage. He has you in the palm of his hand. It says that he is trustworthy in all of his promises. One of these promises we see in Scripture is Deuteronomy 31 verse 6, where it says that he will never leave us and he will never forsake us. Trust in him because he has got you. He will never leave you and he will never forsake you. The Lord upholds, verse 14, the Lord upholds all who fall and lifts up all who are bowed down. The eyes of all look to you, and you give them their food at the proper time. One of the names of God which we we find in the story of Abraham taking his son to be sacrificed, and God provides a ram in order for him to sacrifice the ram rather than his son. And um, Abraham calls that place uh, the mountain of of the provider. Um, And we know it as Jehovah Jireh our provider. And this not only speaks of a God who would um, provide 
his son to be the ultimate sacrifice, to take our place on a cross um, so that we could be restored to the Father. But it also speaks of a Father in heaven who will supply all our need. And I love how last week John shared on the feeding of the 5,000. What an amazing story. And Jesus is presented with five loaves and two fish. And understandably, that is not enough for 10,000 odd people. But Jesus, he understands and he knows where the provision really comes from. And so what he does is he takes the five loaves and the two fish. And looking up to heaven, he gives thanks and he breaks the bread. And so I love what it said here. The eyes of all look to you and you give them their food at the proper time. We have seen much need in this time. If you have a need, I want to encourage you. Lift your eyes to him. Cry out to him and he will provide your need at the proper time. Verse 16, it says, you open your hand. Isn't that fitting after the uh, verse that we've just read in 15? The eyes of all look to you and you will provide. You will open your hand at the right time. Beautiful. Lift your eyes to him and he will open his hand. You satisfy the desires of every living thing. The Lord is righteous in all his ways and faithful in all he does. The Lord is near to all who call on him, to all who call on him in truth. He fulfills the desires of those who fear him and he hears the cry and saves them. Friends, I want to encourage you in this time. You may be going through some stuff. The scripture is clear. Cry out to him. Call on the name of the Lord and he will hear your cry. Right now, you can cry out to him knowing that he hears you. Matthew 6 verse 8, it says that the Father knows what you need before you even ask for it. The Lord is near and he will hear your cry. Call out to him. Verse 20 says that the Lord watches over all who love him, but all the wicked he will destroy. So very short uh, verse in, in this chapter, and um, as such, I'm not going to spend much time on it. But verse 21 moves on to say that my mouth will speak in praise of the Lord. Let every creature praise his holy name forever and ever. I love how it begins and how it ends. It begins with worship and it ends with worship. If your heart is filled with the abundance of God and his greatness, your mouth will overflow with praise of him. But not only will your praise of him continue day to day, but those who are, who are determined to worship him, to praise him, to give him honor and give him glory here on earth, will most definitely continue to praise him forever and ever and for an eternity in heaven. Because God's goodness will continue for eternity and so will the praise of from the saints who praise him. <laughs> Close your eyes with me, please. Father God, I thank you, Lord, for your goodness and your greatness. And I thank you, Lord, that as we have heard these, this scripture, as we have focused on the bigness of your greatness, the bigness of your works, I thank you, Lord God, that our response is to worship you in spirit and in truth. Lord, as many used to love saying, take your glory, Lord God. Take your glory in our lives. And Lord, if we have not worshipped you the way that you deserve up until this point, I pray that going forward, we will do nothing in our lives but give every single moment of our day to worship and praise your mighty name. Thank you, Lord God, for the word that has been shared. And I thank you, Lord, that it will cut us to the heart. Lord God, that it will penetrate our hearts, penetrate our minds, 
and that, will, that it will affect change in us, Lord God. We praise you, Lord Jesus, for who you are and for what you've done. And we ask that you bless this word to us in your mighty name. We pray. Amen. Thank you so much, friends. Have a wonderful day. And we look forward to seeing you again soon. Cheers for now.